Welcome to today's online service replay. My name is Stella and here is the latest recorded sermon from our Malaga Hub. So get ready with something to take some notes down and we pray and anticipate that God will speak to you through his word and through today's speaker. Go you your Bibles, why don't you turn to Acts chapter 4, please. Acts chapter 4. If I haven't yet met you as you're turning, my name is Josh and I get to serve on the pastoral team here in the Grace Life family. If you don't have a home church, you are welcome. Welcome anytime. Whether you are a Christian or you're not a Christian, you are absolutely welcome to be part of our Sunday services. You're welcome to be part of any of the programs that we run during the week. Our prayer is that you will in some way get to experience the tangible, the practical, the real love of God uh, through his people. Acts chapter 4. I'm going to first of all speak to all the mummers out there, all the mums, all the mums. I have a question, mums. Once you got married, how long was it before you were asked, so when's a baby coming? Did it happen pretty quick? And once the first one came, how long was it before you then asked, when's the next one? And then you responded either with a, a backhander or a, just give it some time. Then you had two and then, okay, don't stop at two. When's the next one? Mums ever get tired of hearing that question? I've got three gorgeous daughters. We had one, we thought, oh, we shouldn't stop at one. Oh, why stop at two? Aren't they gorgeous? And then they grow up and you're thinking, yeah, we stopped. <laughs> So when it comes to experiencing God, encountering God or works of God, we often have these moments, these encounters, and we can feast off that in that moment, but then forever and a day after, the next year, the two years, the 10 years, we keep feeding off that, not realizing that we don't have to stop at one, that there's more. There's more. Do you know that? There's more. When you have an experience of God, You need to know we have a God who is so lavish and abundant upon us. He is constantly wanting to reveal more of himself to us. In our services, in our prayer meetings, through our life groups, we get reports of people that get breakthrough, that have encounter moments, that have healing. Why stop there? Why stop with just that? And what other acts of the supernatural can result from that. In Acts chapter 4, we see an onflow of a supernatural act in Acts chapter 3. In Acts chapter 3, there was a 40-odd-year-old, no-named, disabled, social outcast. He was healed. An act of the supernatural took place. And we pick up in Acts chapter 4 with an onflow one act of the supernatural led to several other acts of the supernatural. The act of the supernatural and healing in Acts chapter 3 led to a supernatural act of proclamation from Peter and John, which then led to a supernatural act of determination and grit, conviction. And then we see a supernatural act of impartation from God himself upon his people. It really is quite profound, where if the act of the supernatural just stopped and nothing was done after that, if there was no dialogue, if there was no profession, if there was no proclamation, if there was no deep conviction showing itself outworked, so much more blessing would have been missed out on. And so we pick up on the story in Acts chapter 4 today, following on an amazing miracle of the man who couldn't walk, being healed just from Peter saying, I don't have any silver and gold. But I tell you what I do have. I'm going to give to you now. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. That's all it was. Acts chapter 4, we find that some religious people were getting pretty upset by this because there was a lot of talk going on. And they weren't getting all the attention. All the religious people weren't getting the attention. Jesus was getting all the attention. 
That's how you know when you're dealing with religious people. We have our eyes fixed on us and not on Jesus. And so Pharisees, Sadducees, religious people were there and they are bringing, bringing Peter and John before them. It says, on the next days, their rulers and elders in verse 5 and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? This is really important for us. Verse 8, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed, done to a crippled man by what means this man has been healed let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified whom God raised from the dead by him this man is standing before you well this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you the builders which has become the cornerstone and which has become excuse me and there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved so what happens here peter and john help the guy heal the guy they're being hauled before the rulers and the authorities and what do they do what happens they don't cower they don't draw back but god comes through and he fills Peter, you see, and then Peter speaks. Was this the first time that Peter was filled? Wasn't the first time. Tells us that there needs to be continual infilling of the Holy Spirit. Continually, continually. You might have been filled at one moment. Pray for, for a continual infilling of the Holy Spirit. Because when you become full of the Holy Spirit, you start to look and smell and sound a lot like Jesus. Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. He leads us to Christ and transforms us into the image of Christ. I can't become like Jesus without the precious grace and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So here we see the Holy Spirit fills Peter and then uh, uh, Peter speaks, speaks, speaks. Now there are certain dangers when it comes to this boldness because he stepped forward but with boldness. If you're writing um, um, notes and you want to take a sermon title, the dangers of a holy boldness, the dangers of a holy boldness, you can write down. One of the dangers of a holy boldness we can see after the Holy Spirit comes upon Peter is that there, there is a commitment to a strong proclamation in the face of opposition. A strong proclamation in the face of opposition. I would dare say that um, boldness is only required in the midst of those moments of opposition and tribulation. If everything so easy and cushy, is there real such need for courage? When the presence of fear exists, that is the opportunity for boldness and courage to stand forth. What is it that God says to Joshua in chapter 1? Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. Why? For the Lord thy God is with you. God is with you. And because he's with you, we can be strong and courageous. Now, he said that to Joshua several times, in fact, if you read that passage, chapter 1. And Joshua had to feed off that word because he was faced with battle after battle. As you read the book of Joshua, it's incredible. The the the, the the nation of Israel was led under Moses, but they were in captivity. They were under dominion, under rule. They were in slavery. But God had something different for God's people in this coming season. They were going to move from captivity and being under dominion in, into taking dominion. And so they were, they, they, there were some big changes in the nation of Israel. And Joshua, the appointed leader, he had a different leader for a different season. He does this had to feed off God's word that God was with him. And because God was with him, he had to be strong and courageous. It wasn't just an option. Hey, Joshy babes, 
If you don't mind, would you please, if you're feeling in the mood, if you, if you feel good after you leave, you know, Sunday morning service, if you feel good, can you have just the tiniest bit of courage? No. I've commanded you, be strong and of good courage. But that comes when the Holy Spirit comes more than anything. We are so blessed that we have the Holy Spirit to move as believers in boldness and courage without God is not true boldness and courage. I need God's spirit to overwhelm me so I can truly ooze the boldness of Christ. There is a, an American evangelist by the name of George Verwa, who passed away actually in April of last year. He is the founder of Operation Mobilization. Here's a quote. He says, without the Holy Spirit boldness, the world will remain unevangelized. There can never be a substitute for the power of the Spirit working through willing men and women. And that power will bring boldness. Will bring boldness. Think about that for a second. Peter and John did not watch their P's and their Q's. They knew they could have gotten deep trouble. But Peter, with the, with the enabling of the Holy Spirit, not only did he go, um, um, we're really sorry, we're just trying to help, we're just going to help a brother out. He didn't do that. In fact, he turned it around. Watch this. He says, uh, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, which means through the person, through the authority of Jesus Christ, of Nazareth, whom you crucified, ouch, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you. It has become the cornerstone and there is salvation in nobody else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. What are they doing? Drawing a line in the sand. When the Holy Spirit comes on you and you move in boldness, that's what takes place. When you move in God, whatever it is you're standing for, that's what you're doing. You're drawing a line in the sand. Because what you're doing is you're promoting truth. Remember, God is truth. You're promoting truth. And truth by its nature is divisive. I'm telling you, I have, I have upset a few people in my time. Sometimes by my own stupidity. Other times by just speaking truthfully. I was out talking to who is now, someone who's now a, a good friend of mine. And I was at a kid's birthday party. We we're out and uh, I just saw him. He was a parent of uh, one of my girl's friend's friends. We were there and all of a sudden we started a conversation. As he starts to talk, uh, we start talking about everything under the sun. From politics to family to faith. And I like it when it gears toward faith. And I don't go in when I talk about faith. I don't say, I don't come in with my calling card. Don't you know I'm a preacher, I'm a pastor. I just... I don't want to ruin my street cred, so I just keep it on the down low. I'm just another guy. So as we start to talk, um, he starts talking about his background and how he has gone into a Buddhist background. He's become a monk for a year or two in training. He doesn't know anything uh, outside of that right now, but believes that all paths lead to God. And then he joyfully asked me my position. I said, well, I'm a Christian. He goes, well, we all end up in the same place. I said, well... With respect, I don't agree with that. He goes, well, what do you mean? I said, well, uh, the gospel is inclusive, but exclusive by nature. Inclusive in that everyone is invited, but exclusive in that only those that accept the invitation are saved. What do you mean? I said, well, we believe, Christians hold to the fact that Jesus Christ himself says, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no way to the Father except through me. No way. Now, that's just what we believe. I can't be right and you can't be right on the same issue. Well, we started to talk a little bit. Underlying a lot of that is his um, historical uh, distaste for interactions with certain Christians. We all have them, right? Um, but as we talked, I think he 
he then finds out I'm a, I'm a pastor preacher guy. And he goes, he swears. I won't tell you what he saw. He goes, you're a pastor. He goes, you're a bit different. I said, I'm sorry for the pastors you've caught up with, but we're not all that bad. You know, some of us are actually all right. Anyway, he says, I'd like to continue the conversation at some point. So I said, okay, all right. So he, I tell him about the church. I tell him where we are. I take down his number. That was on a Saturday. Um, Sunday comes around. I hadn't called him. I hadn't contacted him. But lo and behold, I get a phone call from someone here. It says, hey, listen, uh, this guy you met yesterday is here waiting for you at church. He'd come to church. He's on a faith journey as it stands, right? Um, and what he respects is that there are Christians that make a stand and don't compromise. If we're ever living in a day and an age where we see compromise, it's got to be now. Why are we compromising? Who are we afraid of? What is this gospel of tolerance that we must bow the knee to? In, in preaching tolerance, we're actually becoming largely intolerant as a people, as a, 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 as a society, as a world that we live in. Subjective relativism can't lead us all to God where what is right for you and right for you is right for you and right for you. And no, there's, there's got to be an objective standard. There has got to be a sense of someone's got to be right and someone's got to be wrong, right? We can't all be right, which is why I think it's so incredibly important that we keep coming back to this because we might like to be progressive, call ourselves uh, up to date and Who's changing? Is it God or is it us? We think that we have developed as a people because we have advanced our theology. It's, it's, it's moved with the times. Then that renders this ineffective. This is such an incredibly important book, brothers and sisters. Let's not just dust it off on a Sunday morning. Let's be positively bold and courageous in our stance for it. When you're faced with op the more opposition you're faced with, uh, the more opportunity there is for your boldness to develop. I mean, let's think about Fremantle Docker supporters. Uh, I'm a West Coast Eagles supporter. I haven't been too loud about it in the last 12 to 24 months for obvious reasons. I mean, we won last year, didn't we? The wooden spoon. Right. But I, I genuinely, hand on heart, feel for all the Docker supporters out there because how much pain and suffering must you endure year after year. I mean, while the West Coast Eagles, what, we've won in 1990, 1992, 2006, 2018, who's counting? Fremantle Dockers started in what year was it? 1995 or thereabouts? 95. How many flags have they got? How many cups have they got in the cabinet at the moment? Zero. Oh, sorry. I thought that, oh, I, I, I thought, I thought so. But what is it done? When you talk to a Fremantle Dockers supporter, like you're not changing them. They've been through too much. This. They're strong on their convictions that there's always next year. What am I saying here without losing a portion of the congregation and people streaming in about supporting Fremantle? It's that when there is opportunity for opposition, it, it can actually develop our boldness and courage. So when you're faced with opposition, don't run from it. Stand in the midst of it. That's what we see from the Bible here. Peter and John didn't cower. They stood tall. Let's continue on. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Let's read on. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they saw the boldness, okay? So it wasn't, wasn't uh, absent. It was present. It was clear. It was evident. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and they perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. So they perceived, let's stop there for a moment. They perceived that, that they were uneducated common men. Do you know that God is less interested? I've said this last week. He is less interested in your capability and more in your availability. You know that, don't you? But that doesn't mean that God doesn't care at all. Because God uses educated and uneducated people. I mean, uneducated people. There are plenty of people in the Bible, not just here, that God uses. They're uneducated, but God used them powerfully. Think about uh, Charles Spurgeon, uneducated before. Think about Martin Lloyd, Joint, Martin Lloyd Jones. Think about amazing people like that. How about D.L. Moody? These were not scholars before God got hold of them. But God also uses educated people. He uses people in the Bible like Moses or Daniel or Paul. They were educated people. 
educated people today for us, for example, we know of uh, Billy Graham, an educated man. We know St. Augustine or Martin Luther, educated people. So the point here is God will use you if you're educated or not, but don't write yourself off if you're not educated, if you haven't gone to Bible school. Because once the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you, look out. Now watch this. It says, they recognized then that they had been with Jesus. That's what they had seen. What is it about these guys? There's a boldness that they're speaking. Ah, we got it. They've been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with, with one another saying, what shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem and we can not deny it. I love it when God does something and other people can't deny it. Have you ever had that moment? Have you ever been healed of something? Have you ever been delivered from something? Have you ever changed inside? And people look back and go, uh, I can't deny what, what I see here. I told this story a couple of years ago about a man named Bjorn, who became a friend of mine. The same year that I complained to God, God, why are we in our church not seeing more miracles outside of the Sunday service? And I felt like the Holy Spirit say is, take responsibility for your own miracles. That same year, I started looking at open doors in my life to just pray for people. This guy, Bjorn, came out of Gumtree. Who uses Gumtree anymore? I, I was selling something on Gumtree. I was selling a shed. He came out to the house and I'm, I'm trying to sell this guy a shed. So I'm, I'm not trying to be overly holy and lose the sale. But I, do, I, do, I don't want to hide my light under a bushel either. So as he's there, he's limping around and I'm interested to see if he's going if he, if to buy the shed off me. Not only do I want the money, I want the shed off my property, right? So what happens is I notice that he's limping around and his bunion, his bunion was sticking out. And as he's limping, I said, mate, what happened to your foot? He goes, a couple of months ago, he's an engineer by his trade, by his background, just got back from China. He said, I just got back from China a couple of months ago. I fell off my bike. I injured my foot. I said, oh, I'm sorry to, sorry to hear that. He goes, yeah, the surgeon says I can operate on it. It'll cost a couple of thousand dollars to fix it or I'll leave it. And it'll, it'll, um, it'll fuse like that, but the pain will eventually go. I'm like, okay. So what are you going to do? He goes, I'm not going to pay a couple of thousand bucks. I'm almost 60 years old. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with, with it fusing and that be it. I'll write it out. I said, okay. And I had a brainwave. Why don't I just pray? Keeping in mind the prompting and the conviction of the Holy Spirit to say, be responsible for your own miracles. So I said, hey, can I pray for you? He goes, okay. I put my hand on his shoulder. I didn't, clo I didn't close my eyes. I didn't do a shabba dabba doo -da. I didn't bring the extra virgin olive oil and splash it all over him. I didn't do any of that. I just put my hand on his shoulder. I said, Lord Jesus, thank you for Bjorn. I like him. He's a good man. But I pray for his foot right now. I pray that you bring healing. And over the next two days, may it be a, a, a healing that is worked through and walked out. And he said to me, and I want the pain to go too. He says, he nudged me. I said, Lord, take the pain away. Now I said, okay, great. Now have a guess what happened in that moment. Nothing. Nothing happened in that moment. But after that moment, we continue the conversation. And as he walked down toward the car, as he went, um, something, he noticed something. Now on his foot, on his right foot, on his injured foot, the middle toe was longer than the other ones due to the, due to the injury. Okay. Now, on his left foot, that was not the case. It's not supposed to be that way. But on the right foot, there was a clear deformity in one of his toes. As we walked down to the car, he walked about to get in his car at the verge. He, I said, let me know what you want to do about the, um, the shed, mate. He goes, yeah, yeah, I will. And then as he got in the car, he shrieked. He goes, hey. He goes, my foot's healed. My foot's healed. And he couldn't believe it. He couldn't deny it. I said, I said yeah. Of course it is, mate. Of course it, of course it is. Yeah, me full of faith and all that, right? And he goes, and he's, and he's, he, he can't compute. E equals MC squared, not working out. You know, engineer, engineer speaking his brain. He's like, I, I, I don't, I don't. And, and he, and I had a look at it, and his toe had actually sunk back in. His foot, his foot, in the matter of about 10, 20 minutes, had actually started to heal up and align up, right? He, he gave me his phone, and he said, "Can you please take a photo of this for me?" I said, "Yeah." 
He put his hand next to it just for perspective. I took a photo of it and he just could not explain it. I said, I'm telling you, man, God's real. He said to me, you know, uh, I have heard, uh, I have heard that the brain has great power over the body and healing properties to bring about um, really some amazing things in the human body. I said, yeah, yeah, it's true that the brain can do that. I've read articles, medical journals and all that too. I said, I'm an, I'm an engineer too, right? So I said, but your brain didn't think that this would happen. You doubted it. He goes, that's true. And I said, so your brain couldn't have caused this to happen. He goes, I guess you've got a point. I said, I'm telling you, God's real. Two days later, he sent me a text message. He, he said, Josh, my foot's better. The pain's all gone. You've made a believer out of me. Isn't God good? Now, God is good. He is good. And all it took was, let me pray for you. Let me pray for you. Let me pray for you. And when God does something, be mindful that there are people, they're, they're going to watch, they're going to observe, they're going to perceive. And they're not going to be able to question. But we've got to put ourselves in that position first. So there's got to be an allegiance to deep conviction without fear of repercussion. That's what's going on here. Watch this. I'm going to read on. In order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. I love this. Verse 19. Look at the courage. <laughs> Look at the courage of these guys. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they threatened them even more. When they further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. They were scared of the people. That's what they were. Because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. We've got to make a decision. For our allegiance to lead us to deep conviction without fear of repercussion. Do you know that when you make a stand for Jesus, you should not fear reprisal. You should not fear folding back. See what happened with Peter and John. And can I say, brothers and sisters, we'll have these every single day. And the more that we stand for Jesus, the greater risk that there is of repercussion. But that's okay, because that's where the miracles continue to unfold. Remember, this could have stopped at just the healing. This could have then stopped when Peter and John were faced with opposition, but they decided to keep on going, to keep on pressing, keep on going and then what we see is other people were praising God and you know what all the threats counted for nothing they couldn't restrict them they couldn't hold them back some of the most humble ministers I've ever met are the most persecuted and I what can I do I let me just cut let me just let me just carry water let me just tie your shoelaces let me do something real courage real boldness real conviction especially only comes when the Holy Spirit comes upon us in the face of our opposition, in the face of our oppression, in the face of our tribulation. Let's not be afraid. Let's be motivated. Let's be encouraged. What hill will you die on? What are your deeply held convictions? What are your convictions? Think about it for a second. What things will you say without a shadow of a doubt, this is what, what I will not waver from? What are the parts of God, the aspects of God, the virtues of God that he himself has revealed to you? That you know, no matter what, you're taking that to the bank. See, one of mine is that he's with me. I've already mentioned it. He's with me, his presence. See, it doesn't matter what happens, what you do, what I'm surrounded with, what environment I'm placed. I know that as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil because he is with me. That then forms a body of truth for me. That's a revelation that becomes a deeply held conviction. What's yours? 
It's very important that we have them. So we continue. We're going to see something pretty crazy here. We're going to see, in the last passage, we're going to see God's people start to pray for more pain. Pay attention to this. When they were released, they being Peter and John, when they were released, they went to their friends and reported that the chief priests and the elders had said to them, and when they heard it, right, when the believers heard it, they lifted their voices. There's something in lifting your voices, people. There is something to be said for lifting your voices. I, I, when I pray, most of my prayers are quiet. They're in my heart. They're by myself. But there is something to be said when I raise my voice, when I do it with others. This is what they did. They lifted their voices. In fact, the word voices there is singular. It wasn't they just lifted their voices separately. They lifted it together. They were of one accord. They were in unison. They lifted their voices. They lifted their one voice together, together to God. And they said, Sovereign Lord. That, that, that word Lord is actually a, a different type of Lord. There it, it is despotes, which doesn't just mean Lord. It has reference of master or ruler, someone who rules over and has authority to execute. And it says this, Sovereign Lord or ruler or master who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Watch now, this is an important verse. Okay, keeping in mind what they're doing is they are reminding themselves of the sovereignty of the rulership, of the mastership, of the lordship of Jesus, of God. Right? This is what they pray. Now, Lord, look upon their hearts and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. What? Wasn't it boldness that got them into trouble? What? Lord Jesus, please make them stop the pain. That's not what they do. Grant us. The ability to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand, not us, it's not our hands that does the miracles, it's God, while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled, again, for some of them, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. First point, commitment to strong proclamation in the face of opposition. The second one, allegiance. We see allegiance to deep conviction without fear of repercussion. The final one, because you know I like to work in threes, just like the Trinity, right? I'm a very Trinitarian type of pastor here. Hunger for divine intervention that brings transformation. A hunger for divine intervention that brings transformation. That's what they were hungering for. They weren't just praying for peace here. That's not what they were praying for. They had the person of peace already living within them. What they're praying for is God's intervention so they could see transformation. They wanted people to get saved. The very thing that got them into trouble, signs and wonders and boldness, they wanted more of that. And, and, and how are they going to get it? They're not going to do a course. They're not going to go to more church services. They're going straight to the source. They're going straight to God himself. Oh, if we could just be a people that by the power and the leading, by the presence of the Holy Spirit, we can lay hands on the sick that they would recover. That we would lead to salvation those that are lost. That, they, that we would bring deliverance to those that are captive. But we've got to go to ourselves. For ourselves, we've got to go boldly to the throne room of grace. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 16 says that. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Where do we go for this boldness? To the throne room. That's where it comes from. You can't get it from your spouse. You can't get it from your life group leader. You can't get it from your pastor. You've got to go to God for yourself. Get your own oil. Get every single person. Get your own oil. And let's hunger for God's divine intervention. Because when we do, you know it attracts the grace of God. 
divine intervention. Do you want to hear a great miracle story? A testimony? It's about Josh and Melinda Newland. Josh is with the children's ministry. I saw Melinda. She's in the back there with the little one, Elijah. I had permission to share this. Desperate for God's intervention. They have a young boy named Elijah, but before Elijah came around, they lost seven. Lost seven children and felt, wow, this is a miracle with Elijah. Late last year, she fell pregnant. Lost that one as well. But in the midst of this, they were just desperate for God's intervention. Christmas time, when that baby was supposed to be born, they were able to tell their family that they were pregnant with a child that was 12 weeks. This week, I understand, is 20 weeks. Mel is 20 weeks pregnant. In the midst of trial and the natural, God came through. That is an unfolding miracle right there. I asked Mel last week, how would you feel about sharing it? She goes, oh, it's just too emotional for me, to be honest, but I just want to give hope to people. I want to give hope. I want to give hope to all the ladies, all the women out there. We serve a God who still does miraculous things. You know that. When we read the book of Acts, you know that we're living out Acts 29 right now. And when you look at other Christians, you're seeing Acts 29 unfold. Your neighbors, your friends, your colleagues, they can read the book of Acts through your life. But let's never give up. We need God's divine intervention here. As we finish, it says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. We see this incredible transformation, continual oneness. No one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. As the musos come, please. Verse 33, And with great power, The apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. See what happens. It all started off with praying for someone. Silver and gold gold have I none, but in the name of Jesus, get up, rise and walk. One miracle, one work of the supernatural led to another one. A bold proclamation. Which led to another one of no matter what, there's a strong resolution. Not going to buckle. We're not going to fold. We're not going to cower. Which led to another. 5,000 people now, I say. 5,000 people. No one was in need. You see what did this amazing transformation? Because they were, hang on, these guys are uneducated, common people. What? And they were astonished. Who do these guys think they are? They didn't go to Harvard or Yale. They didn't do any of that. But what the, who are they? Oh, right. They'd been with Jesus. Which is so good for every one of us. Which tells us that every single one of us, whether we're in the room, whether we're streaming from home, we all have the same access. We all have the same opportunity. We all have all that we need that pertains to life and godliness. I don't just want to preach the word. I want a demonstration of his power. But I need the Holy Spirit to move me in the realm of courage and boldness. Instead of preaching against fear, we preach for his boldness. There's only really one bold one, and that's Jesus. And once we have him and once we have his spirit, we just let him ooze out. Would you stand with me, please? We're going to pray for boldness just now. We're going to pray for boldness. Acts chapter 14, verse 3, later on it said, They remained for a long time speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of His grace 
granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Boldness, boldness, and it preceded the miraculous. How many miracles are just waiting on the other side of your act of boldness? Your word of boldness, your prayer of boldness. All the miracles don't just need to happen on a Sunday morning. You understand that, right? The overwhelming majority of Jesus' miracles were done outside of the temple. So let's go get our own miracles. Can we pray for his boldness to come on us now? Can we pray? Are you ready to pray? I understand it's hot. I'm feeling it too. But I tell you what, I want him. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. That's the only name that matters. And we pray for boldness. Not boldness of the flesh, but boldness by your spirit. We need your Holy Spirit to come upon us, to ooze from us, to compel us, to motivate us, to lead us, to grace us for your glory. It's not our glory, it's your glory. This is about you. So we ask, Father, you would be the hero of our lives. You would be the center of our lives. I pray, Father, where there is timidity, where there is fear, where there is angst and apprehension, where there is uncertainty, Lord, help us not overanalyze and overcomplicate, but help us by your spirit empowerment to speak forth and act in boldness, to make decisions about our lives in boldness and faith. I pray for a boldness to come upon your people in this year, in this season, like never before. We take boldness in our relationships, into our homes, into our places of work, into our places of education, into our places of, uh, of play and, and social outlet, into the places where we walk the dog, where we shop for food. Lord, everywhere we go, we pray for boldness. And may we see the opportunities like never before and step forward in that. In Jesus' name. Before we move on to the updates, I encourage you now to take a few moments to spend with God and ask Him what it is that He's been highlighting to you through the Scriptures and through the Word today and just sit and chat with Him about that. Hi, my name is Globern and welcome to Church News. This is your hub of information so you can stay up to date in the life of Grace Life. Bread tables are available for anyone in the community who is in need of bread or perhaps some veggies. We encourage you to go on to our Facebook page or our Instagram page as well and share the social media posts with any of your online communities, your neighbor or even your family. Please take note of the schedule of when this ministry is available in Ellenbrook or Malaga. You are also welcome to come get some bread for yourself or bring them to your neighbor as well. Thanks for sharing. Grace Life Seniors, your first morning tea of the year is this Wednesday at the Malaga Hub. To celebrate the day of love, we encourage you to come in your brightest and most beautiful red attire. It could be a dress, it could be necktie, a hat, whatever you have that's red. Bring a plate and invite someone along. If you'd like to know more information, feel free to speak to Alan and Marjorie in Malaga or Andrew and Wendy in Elmbrook. Grace Life Men, a great opportunity for you to start the year strong. 
come along to the men's breakfast at the Malaga Hub from 8 till 10 and be excited. We have Pastor Scott sharing the word on this morning. So please make sure to put your name down as well as a friend that you are considering to invite at the sign up station. Um, this is very important so we can cater to you guys and have extra bacon and eggs for everyone. If you are newish to Grace Life and have been coming along for some time now, we invite you to the We Are Grace Life information session. In this session, we have lunch together, get to know each other, and volunteers and leaders will also share about who we are as a church, our identity, our mission, our vision, and our values. This is also a great opportunity for you to ask questions. So if you're interested in joining this session, please put your name down at the sign-up station in your location. The next We Are Grace Life session is going to be on the 3rd of March, 12.30 p.m. at the Ellenbrook Hub. There are many ways that we contribute to the family here at Grace Life, and one of them is through giving. If you have been giving already, thank you for your generosity. But also, if you haven't, please consider joining us in this wonderful act of worship. There are many ways to give, and they will be shown on the screen. You can also come to the information desk and give via FPOS or credit card. If you would like to stay up to date with what's happening at Grace Life, please visit our website, gracelife.com.au, or you can also follow our social media. Thanks for watching today's sermon. We do pray that God has spoken to you um, and that this sermon would impact your world and your life. And if you do have any questions or you are deciding to follow Jesus for the first time, then feel free to contact us on the email below and we'd love to help you out. Have a great week. <laughs>